Yeah, so um, I. When I first walked in, I'm very super different. It's kind of like a little bit of practice. Or very Yeah. Not an actual, like, spend it on 
like a seven month old studio. No. You know, like it's like I like need to be calibrated in the opposite direction of showing, which is actually going down. Yeah. I think the like the the fellow before me had like more time. Okay. So I hope that I don't know like what the <laughs> I went on oh, so a lot of but Yeah. But yeah, I think it needs to be like six degrees. Uh, yeah. it's still yeah. But it's really a great thing for me because I, I mean, like, even though I'm like, I made my like, direct my the project I'm developing is like, like, yeah. and I was like, I feel like sometimes I, I don't know how to like position myself in the like, contemporary art world because, yeah. because the terms that I use in order to describe my practice and just like the way that I access the material to make my films or work on my like digital images. Yeah. Because I have not always used with like all of the other things. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, sure, totally. That was great. Uh, so we're kind of ready for you are. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. Are you sure? Oh, like, oh, oh, oh. no, no, I can do it. Or you Yes, sorry. So welcome to the I so just to let you know, I can hear you when you're speaking with somebody. Uh, okay. The back. So if you're, if you want me to turn the lights back on or anything, you can just say until my Josh can do that. Okay. okay. Oh, okay, great. Guy, if you okay. This. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. We're all set. Okay. Uh, Okay. So is uh, the um, yeah. 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 Really? Oh, that's so great. Oh, that's fantastic. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Steph? This is a mic situation. Yeah. <clears throat> that worked for one person. Thank you, Swapna. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Bienvenue. Hello. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. It's really nice to welcome you to another Conversations in Contemporary Art gathering. Um, and this is the last Sika talk of 2022, uh, but one that has been much anticipated. Uh, I was trying to scroll back, like during COVID, pre COVID. We're still in COVID, but this has been on the books with Mara for almost over a year. And we were hoping to wait until that certain time wherein we could gather in person in VA 114, which is where we are now. Um, and to, yeah, welcome you to do an artist talk as part of the platform. So it's nice to finally be at this moment. 
Um, I am Maya. Um, it's nice to meet some of you for the first time to welcome some of you back. I'm the convener, a coordinator, I forget the title per se, of Conversations in Contemporary Art. Um, and I have been so for a number of years, um, long enough to not let COVID folks uh, disappear on us and bring them back in <laughs> so that we can continue the programming with them. Um, I'm also an assistant professor in the Studio Arts Department, uh, which is where SICA is based, specifically within the MFA program within Studio Arts. Um, and Conversations in Contemporary Art is a um, uh, speaker series um, that welcomes, I'm looking to Mara like, what is SICA? <laughs> Uh, it's a, a speaker series that welcomes curators, writers, artists um, in this capacity, artists, but also former Bromfin Fellow from 2020 to share their practice in formats that serve them. Uh, sometimes an artist talk, sometimes a panel discussion, sometimes a demo, sometimes a debate. Uh, and it's really a chance to have a chance <laughs> to uh, share ideas, uh, to talk about art, to talk about process, to talk about dissemination of ideas. Um, and then to invite that into a conversational capacity. So the order of the evening will unfold with a few more minutes of introductory shenanigans. Um, then we will hand things over to Mara, who will share their practice with you. Uh, we'll then have plenty of time for a nice um, Q&A conversation discussion. Uh, and then up towards 7.30, we'll start to warm, warm down, wind down the evening. Uh, and you're all happily invited to uh, refreshments at Grumpy's nearby uh, to share in beverages and pizza and nourishing conversation. Uh, I also want to make sure that we welcome Zoom folks into the space. Uh, we have uh, the same amount in the space as on the Zoom currently. Uh, for the past two years, Sika has pretty much been Zoom only, experimenting with webinar and Zoom meetings and different formats. Uh, but we're now continuing in a hybrid fashion um, so welcome into the room also Zoom folks. Uh, I know Mara is hoping to have people from all over the place, not just Jodage, uh, Muniang, Montreal. Um, Adele and I, uh, my co-host, I'm one half of the co-hosting team, will be moderating the Zoom chat. So if you have any questions or things you want to bring in to the space with Mara, please do let us know in the space of the chat. Uh, this is also being recorded. So thank you, Mara, for that generosity. Um, the recordings for conversations and contemporary art events live on the SICA website. Uh, you'll see that on the posters and the publicity that brought you to this event in the first place. So if there's anything you want to revisit or to pass on some of the insights that Mara shares with us this evening, do know that that will be appearing on the website within a couple of days time. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Adele, uh, my co-host for the evening, also a film production graduate student here at Concordia. And Adele is going to acknowledge territory and then bring Mara into the space. Thanks, Adele. Um, so for the territorial acknowledgement today, um, I thought that uh, I thought to read a, a slightly different one from the previous uh, CICA talks. Uh, uh, for the ones who are in um, Anna Klaus uh, Seminary, uh, with me, uh, we one of the ex the main exercises of the seminary was to um, to formulate together a, a territorial acknowledgement, and uh, I I thought uh, that it was very it, it, that it's very compelling, and I thought why not uh, use this one today? So uh, thank you to all the people who com contributed to uh, putting this together. Um, we gather we gather and thank the past and histories that brought us together here today. We recognize that we are on unceded indigenous lands and that the Ganyangahaga nation is recognized as the lands and waters protectors. We recognize that we are all included in the responsibility of protecting and caring for these lands and waters and are and are accountable to them. This accountability continues in time, known as Jojage by the Ganyenga Haga, which means where the, the waters divide or where the people split. Another name for this place is Otsirage, which means on the fire, as the mountain is central to this island, used to be used to be a volcano. This name is close to the Anishna, the name for the place for this place, Munyang, which means the place that is hollow in reference to a volcano. We acknowledge the languages that have developed and evolved in the voices and lessons of space we gather. The languages are sources of a co cognitive power and knowledge transmitted through oral traditions. As participants of this of this Sika talks, we recognize uh, the process to unsettle will unsettle. We recognize that the discomfort will give us the energy to find strength to do the work 
to listen and to come to a better understanding as responsible guests of this territory. To understand the specific positionalities, re relationalities, and responsibilities evoked by being visitors to someone else's homelands. Um, so, I'll just read it. with uh, Mara's presentation. So, uh, Mara is an American artist living and working in Jojage since uh, 2012. Drawing from the history of science and feminist studies. Her work explore, explores historical contingency of the concept of nature and env envisions the possibility of growth and reg regeneration following the dissolution of the categories of nature, technologies, and the human. In June of 2020, her work was exhibited at the Montreal uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. Her recent exhibitions include group shows at Critical Distance, the University of Kentucky Art Museum, Centre Clark, Printemps Numérique, Studio XX, Leonard and Dina Ellen Gallery, and Saw Video Media Center. Her research has been generously supported by the Bert Bruin Institute, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Fonds de Recherche du Québec, Société Culture, and the El Elizabeth Green Shields Foundation. Mara Eagle is represented by Galerie Pangin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, beautiful introduction. Thank you to everyone in attendance, uh, incarnate and also virtually. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, faces that I love. It's really moving to me to feel all of that support. So thank you. Um, before beginning, I'd like to, of course, express my gratitude, um, tremendous gratitude to Stephen and Claudine Bromfman and to their foundation for providing the uh, incredible opportunity that is the Bronfman Fellowship. I wish everybody luck who submitted ab applications. I believe the deadline was this week. So it's pretty, ex today, it was today no less. So uh, excited um, for the upcoming 2023 fellow to be announced. Um, I also wanted to just mention how grateful I am um, for the support of so so many of my family, friends, family uh, that's uh, not in Montreal, but probably, hopefully, <laughs> attending on Zoom. Um, so thank you to them, uh, mentors, colleagues, um, and everyone who's sort of encouraged me throughout my life as an artist. I decided that the talk I would give here tonight uh, would be sort of for all my friends who <laughs> I knew were coming, um, and not for some imagined anonymous audience. Uh, so tonight I'm considering you all my uh, close inner circle. Um, and so I'm hoping you'll sort of just lean into the tangents and discombobulated nature um, of my presentation. Hopefully we'll experience minimal technical difficulties. So I'm primarily a video artist working in 2 and 3D animation. I work a lot with collage based methods. So bringing together original and also found content. I'm definitely uh, sort of like what, what they often call a post internet artist. Um, however, and, and digitally based for sure. Uh, however, I would say that my focus conceptually tends to be more archaic. I'm more interested in the historical fictions of science rather than forward looking sci-fi. Uh, I love learning about the history of science, technology, the history of medicine, and especially the history of um, the natural sciences as a discipline. So sort of how scientists produce knowledge is something that I just get like so excited about. Um, this is a still image from my video installation called Théâtre de l'Inconnu, which I'll be showing an excerpt of shortly. But first, um, I felt like showing you this marvelous illustration. I'm going to be showing a lot of images from my sort of collection of, of uh, pictures, of course, that all of us as, as artists keep little treasure troves of images. Um, so this is uh, an 18th century illustration um, showing the scientist Luigi Galvini's accidental discovery that the spinal cords of even a dead frog carry uh, an electric charge. So what we're looking at here is a diagram 
um, basically showing that the severed off legs of a frog can be animated using electric shocks. So this is called animal electricity or bioelectricity. Um, it's unclear to me exactly what they're doing, but I really love the little disembodied hands um, and their cuffs. So this is another still image from Théâtre de l'Inconnu. Something I learned recently from my friend's brilliant uh, PhD dissertation is that the etymology of the word animation stems from the Latin root anima, where it has the meaning spirit, soul, breath of air, a living being. So animation, stem of animatio, meaning a bestowing of life. But for me, there's, there's something very deathly about animation because its original object is some type of corpse or a doll, if you prefer. So to this definition, um, I would contribute the idea of animation as a form of resuscitation. Uh, continuing on this topic of dolls and corpses, on the left is an Enlightenment era wax anatomical model that's made with real human hair, real human eyelashes, uh, real pearls, and glass eyes. This and many other similar models of its time were developed as educational tools uh, with the goal in mind of ending the uh, public, the practice of public dissections, uh, which used to take place in operating theaters, which were buildings constructed expressly for the purpose of public dissections you know, across um, various European city centers, uh, some of which still exist and which are my, my dream to visit. So these public dissections, of course, were very messy, um, did not smell nice at all. Uh, I'm very interested in this moment of early modern science or early modern medicine in this case, looking for a visual pedagogical language. And at the time, how it sort of grafted itself onto the iconography of Venus, as well as the, as the iconography of martyred Catholic saints. I'm also super interested in how CGI, as used in today's medical industry and as shown on the right here, figures into this continuum of representation in terms of hyperrealism, um, the uncanny and the, the fantasy of kind of X-ray penetrative vision and the mastery of sight over bodies. So uh, back to my work, this shows the installation of Théâtre de l'Inconnu at the MAC in 2021 uh, in an exhibition that was titled La Machine qui enseigne des airs aux oiseaux, which roughly translates to the machine that taught the bird to sing songs. Um, referencing an actual Enlightenment era machine called a serenette, which I'm going to come back to. So my installation consisted of a two-channel video and an inflatable uh, sculpture for seating. These, these images are from a scientific study and are showing transgenic silkworms. I'm showing you because these are the images that I based the inflatable seating sculpture on. And at one point in the video, the narrator actually refers to this gland when she describes the dissection of a silkworm saying, if you slit one open along the length of its back, you will find a cluster of small intertwined tubes resembling intestines. So in this study, the silkworm's glands were actually bioengineered to produce human collagen instead of silk proteins that would normally be used by the worm in weaving their silk cocoon. So the idea was basically to use the worms as living machines to produce human collagen for use uh, in beauty products specifically. This is a, a still image from the video showing the narrator who was animated in 3D. Uh, her face was skinned, so to speak, using a scientific illustration of moths and butterflies. 
And her voice is acted by one of my close friends, a the artist A.M. Yaldo, who is incognito among us here tonight. So as, as the, the narrator is speaking, she's uh, interrupted by these blasts of opera from a 19th century aria called Poveri Fiori, meaning poor flower, which is sung by the, pro the female protagonist as she is dying on stage. And she's dying from having received a bouquet of poisoned flowers. So I, I'm really interested in the spectacle of tragedy and especially the representation of feminized death. Here's the installation again, where you can see the sculpture of the silk gland. I'm gonna share with you the last five minutes of the video. Ice spots. On the wings of Saturnids are two translucent, oversized eye spots or windows. These eye ah. These sightless eyes are not meant to see, but rather to be seen. These sightless eyes are not meant to be ah are ma ah. These sightless eyes are not meant to see, but rather to be seen. The eye spots, one per wing, are believed to function as decoys to confuse potential predators. The eye spots, one per wing, are believed to function as decoys to confuse potential predators. No mouths. No mouths. Despite being... Despite being... Despite being notorious for devouring clothing, most adult moths do not eat at all. No mouths. No mouths. Despite being notorious for devouring clothing, most adult moths do not eat at all. In fact, many Saturnids, such as the Atlas moth and the Luna moth, do not have mouths. In fact, in fact, most Saturnids, such as the Atlas moth and the Luna moth, do not have mouths. Subsisting entirely on fat reserves accumulated during the lot. <clears throat> In fact, many Saturnids, such as the Atlas moth, and the Luna moth do not have mouths, subsisting entirely on fat reserves accumulated during the larval stage. Unfurnished with any organ to attain nourishment, Saturnids live only, live for only, live for only, Unfurnished with any organ to attain nourishment, Saturnids live for only ah. Unfurnished with any organ to attain nourishment, Saturnids live for only a few short days. Short days. A few short days.
Okay. <clears throat> so, um, in in Théâtre de l'Inconnu, the moth, uh, which we just watched a little excerpt of, the moth rehearses the narrative of her own life cycle and tragic end, as though preparing for a performance. I'm really interested in how the idea of theatricality figures into the sciences. Uh, so, like I mentioned earlier, in context of operating theaters but also in early visual compendiums, such as Thomas Muffet's uh, Theater of Insects, uh, shown on the left there, um, which partially inspired the title Théâtre de l'Inconnu. Opera also figures in, funnily enough, some of you may know one of the earliest printed medical books was called Opera Medicinalia. As I mentioned, I'm very fascinated by the spectacle of tragedy um, and particularly feminized death. So this image shows Asmund Lairdale, a plastic toy manufacturer, um, performing a simulated rescue of mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR resuscitation on the world's first modern CPR doll named Recessi Ann. I own one of these <laughs> dolls. <laughs> <laughs> actually, <laughs> bought one. Um, as some of you might know, the face of Recess the Recessian CPR doll was based on the famous L'Inconnu de la Seine, sometimes just called L'Inconnu or the Unknown One. L'Inconnu de la Seine was the corpse of a girl found in the Seine River whose death mask inspired a lot of Victorian sentiments. Uh, and her plaster death mask, shown on the left, became the basis for the Recessi Ann doll's face, which also became known as the most kissed face in the world. It's lovely. So this probably comes as a big surprise. I'm a huge horror movie fan. I love horror movies. Uh, on the left here is the famous storyboard sequence of Marion Crane's death in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, which as you probably know, is one of the original slasher films. There's all these games of sight and predation in the buildup to her murder with the taxidermied birds of prey, the peephole, and then also this moment of the, 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 the drain and her eye. On the right is another picture from my collection that resonates visually for me and is also connected to a specific childhood memory, which was when I was little, one of my dad's friends who was an ophthalmologist uh, brought home or offered a, to me a cow eyeball that um, as a gift, I guess, uh, to, for the eight-year-old me to dissect it and I dissected a cow eyeball at the dinner table. And so this is roughly what I saw. And I think this experience of dissecting an eye, you know, like the visual apparatus, um, kind of always stuck with me as an artist and, and as a lens-based artist, no less. So the next project I did, which I'm only gonna talk about briefly, is also a two-channel two video and is a sister piece to Théâtre de l'Inconnu. It's called That the Earth is the Middle of the World. And the voice of the speaker, the narrator, is also acted by A.M. Yaldo. As I, as I was, um, again, thinking about this idea of the voice and uh, of language as something that is inseparable from the materiality of things, especially bodily things, the script for the video was adapted from the table of contents of Pliny the Elder's Naturalis Historia, which is a Latin text from the early Roman Empire dating to year 77. I was super moved by the poetics of the table of contents. Uh, it's very Borgesian. Um, it presents kind of this list, sort of like an exhaustive and also exhausting list of all things known to exist. And it um, conjures a cosmos, which is familiar, but also sort of wildly hallucinatory 
and bizarre from a present day perspective. But as bizarre and fantastical as it is, it's also very foundational to sort of Western modes of organizing the world in terms of encyclopedias and in term, terms of how nat natural phenomena are categorized. So I got to show this work in a solo show at Gallery Pangy last winter. Some of you may have seen it. A lot of things were on my mind uh, when I was making this. I was definitely thinking about the Italian tradition of grottos and the grotto-esque slash grotesque in which uh, animals and plants and human bodies are kind of reconfigured into new amalgamations. Uh, Pliny's list became kind of a, an apocalyptic death march, but simultaneously for me, a sort of utopic imagining of origins uh, of a world in which there was sort of, um, you know, a dissolution of boundaries between inner and outer and categories of so-called human and nature, nature technology, technology of, and human. So I'm gonna play another little five minute excerpt. Of the eclipses of the moon and of the sun. Of the magnitude of the stars. Why the stars seem at times more lofty and at times more near. Why the stars are of different colors. And why thunder is ascribed to Jupiter. of the motion of the sun and the irregularity of the day. Of the distances of stars and their harmony. Of the dimensions of the world. and of the harmonic proportions of the universe. On the sound of trumpets heard in the sky. Stones that have fallen from the clouds and of the rainbow. On the nature of hail, snow, hoar, mist, and dew. On the forms of clouds. the unpredictability of the weather in different places. Of the form of the earth and of the nature of the earth. How the water is connected with the earth. On the navigation of the sea, of the rivers, and whether the ocean surrounds the earth. What 
part of the earth is inhabited. That the earth is the middle of the world. Liquidity of the zones. When and where there are no shadows. Where the shadows fall in opposite directions. Yeah, so um, another interlude. This is another special picture from my collection, which I like to keep around. So one of the challenges faced by bioengineers working in the field of stem cell research has been how to deliver oxygen and nutrients to lab cultured tissue as it's developing, because without a vascular network, you get a lot of tissue death. So a few years ago at a research lab in Massachusetts called WPI, uh, they made a breakthrough on this front and they did it in a way that I find very poetic, which was they did it by using the existing vascular network of a spinach leaf. So what we're looking at here is actually human cardiac tissue that has been grown on and replaced the plant cells of the spinach leaf. Um, and this tissue is actually beating living tissue, being kept alive with blood, circulating through the original architecture of the spinach leaf. It's just pure poetry for me. So coming back to that the earth is the middle of the world, I had so much fun doing the sound design for that work. Uh, I spent a lot of time in a sound effects archive uh, designing the sound, like the soundtrack. I have no formal training in animation or film or cinema. So for me, it was the, a, very, a first time experience, a first time experience being in a sound effects archive, which for those of you who don't know, is basically a library uh, housing canned ready-made sounds, which you can layer into a soundtrack. And that's usually done after the visual component of the video has been made. So while I was deep into exploring like the sound effects archive in the evenings, I would come home and relax um, watching videos of people's pet <laughs> parrots on YouTube. <laughs> um, so for some reason I was on a kick. Uh, I will mention that I have a, a, like a low level phobia of birds. Um, so watching this stuff filled me with like the awe and repulsion that <laughs> I get from watching horror movies, which I also really love to do, as I mentioned. Um, so this content uh, became the core of the next project, which I've been working on as a Bronfman fellow in which I'm going to share with you shortly. Uh, but just to give you a, the, a kind of idea of um, the content that I was literally so engrossed by, um, I hope it's not going to be too loud, but here we go. Are you 
looking for? What? What's wrong? Okay, good. So one evening uh, after I'd spent sort of all day in the sound effects archive and I was again just like chilling out watching YouTube, watching these bird videos, uh, I came across another video, an excerpt of David Attenborough speaking about the lyre bird, which I'm also going to play, hopefully. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. And that's a car alarm. And now, the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby. So you might see where this is going. Um, something clicked for me when I saw this video. And I think it's because of the way that Attenborough sort of enumerates each sound effect, a uh, car alarm, chainsaw, a camera with a motor drive. And I got the idea or the, the question, would it be possible to create a sound effects archive that was entirely composed of bird sounds, um, specifically kind of representational bird sounds uh, from birds living in captivity? who have adapted their vocabularies to human-centered environments. So I was really curious what kind of narrative would result then based on what was available, the constraints of the archive. So I do have um, a bit of an obsessive streak in my personality. I ended up downloading hundreds and hundreds of uh, these videos off of YouTube. And then going through each one of them, some of them are 45 minutes long, isolating sound bites and organizing them into my own sound effects library. So here you're looking at a screenshot of my archive showing the categories that I sorted the sounds into. So it's a modest amount of categories, uh, but you'll see, but well, I'm not gonna show you because I don't have a screenshot of it, but each folder contains hundreds of sound bites um, you'll see there's a category for speech, which has all the linguistic based content that I used in the animation that I'm going to show you, the film I'm working on, um, that I used for dialogue. So once I felt I had enough variety, I began collaging the sounds together, assembling linguistic utterances into dialogue and creating whatever narratives were possible based on the sound effects that I had available in my archive. So the story I ended up with is 17 minutes long and consists of a series of loosely interwoven vignettes featuring a cast of over 15 human characters. It's set in a suburban sort of North American neighborhood and the movie is called Pretty Talk. Even though I am the director, I do think of this project as very collaborative. Firstly, I didn't write the screenplay. I collaged it from the utterances of birds. So it's very experimental in terms of narrative. Um, and I definitely felt quite decentered, sort of in terms of my own authorship. For me, 
it's become actually their story about humans and a story that like a broken mirror reflects back a sort of best attempt at a portrait of contemporary human life as captured by captive birds. Um, secondly, the production is very collaborative. This is a screenshot of a Zoom call with my animation collaborators, Callum McConnell and Jacob Dutton. Uh, Jason Harvey also helped us in the earlier stages of the video. So none of us have ever met in person. Uh, we all live in different time zones, but they're helping me animate Pretty Talk. It's really incredible uh, working with them and especially working on a project of this scale with such a small team, it's like really intense. Uh, we're lucky to get financial support from a Berkeley-based independent school called Transformations of the Human, um, as well as some funding from CAC and uh, the Canada Council for the Arts. And uh, having the Bronfman Fellowship allowed me to put all of the funding um, into the project because I was already you know, taken care of by the Bronfman Fellowship. Okay, so now I'm gonna play you an excerpt. Uh, it's about five minutes long. Um, and yeah, everything you hear is bird sound. We're gonna be done and it's gonna be premiering at the FOFA Gallery in 2023, in the fall, so. Oh, <laughs> 
so that's um what we have so far but we're really picking up speed um uh, we've got our workflow we're starting to animate the next scene which i'm very excited about <clears throat> so i'm always thinking about the mediums that i work in in this case the parrot's voices were just so uncanny and so hyper realistic that I wanted a visual medium that would reflect that. So I chose this style of 3D animation because for me, like the bird's voices, it has this sort of broken mirror effect um, in which the simulation holds together at the same time as it's falling apart. Uh, one is kind of organic uncanny, or as Barbara Creed calls the primal uncanny. Uh, and the other is more of a technological uncanny, and I wanted to put them into conversation. Uh, another clip I wanted to share with you, this is an African gray parrot, her name's Petra. And she acts a few lines in Pretty Talk uh, as the character of the mother. So um, I'm gonna play it for you. Alexa, what day? It's 2.46 p.m. So Petra has become sort of an incidental user of Amazon's Alexa. Uh, so she asks for dates and times. She makes wish lists, requests music, turns the lights on and off in the room, and apparently also plays with the Bluetooth Christmas tree light. So I'm sort of endlessly fascinated by this um, moment of interaction between non-human voices or speakers and how in appropriating human language, a machine and an animal are in some form of dialogue with each other. So I said I would come back to this. This is a picture of an 18th century machine called a serenette, which inspired the title of the show I was in at the Mac, La Machine qui enseigne des airs aux oiseaux, uh, meaning the machine that taught the songbird to sing tunes, something like that. Um, the word serenette comes from the French serin, meaning canary, because this machine was used to teach popular songs to canaries in order to increase their market value. So here's a still from Pretty Talk. And this is a maquette of uh, an exhibition that I'm working on that I mentioned uh, for next year. This is a sort of simulated view um, of the installation that I'm preparing for the Fofa Gallery. So the staging, this is seating for viewers. It's what it's showing. And so the staging uh, borrows from certain motifs in the film. And It'll be there, yeah, keep an eye open next fall, 2023. I have to come say hi at the opening. And pretty much that's a wrap. So um, thank you everyone for your attention. It's been an honor for me to get to share my work with you. Um, that's my IG handle. If you want to stay au courant of my exhibitions and activities, or if you want to DM me uh, at any point in the future, you can reach me there. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mara, for that rich, rich talk. And now we're at that point in our evening where we can make this a, a dialogue. Uh, if there are questions or comments or curiosities in the audience, um, Zoom room folks, Adele is monitoring the Zoom, so um, they'll let me know if a question comes up. 
but I will roam with the mic. Um, you can also roam if you want, but <laughs> you can stay here, I guess, for, for the Zoom camera. Um, perhaps whilst we sort of shift from this being a dialogue format, I can maybe ask you a question, uh, which is uh, the, I, I really appreciated how you, you started off your remarks with the very intentional framing of like, this is for my friends and I wanna share you, with you what I've been working on and that set a tone for the talk that followed. Um, and I, uh, in some of the images that you shared with us, particularly this one, but also the Théâtre de l'Inconnu at the MAC, there seems to also be a similar desire to set a stage, drawing on your like theatrical, dramaturgical language. How does that feel? Could you talk a little bit more about that as an extension of how you want to have a space of hospitality for your video, video work and how that maybe manifests or how you change your minds? Yeah, sure. I think um, less hospitality, more very committed to um, making the public feel slightly uncomfortable. I'm very passionate on this <laughs> endeavor. Reverse hospitality. <laughs> yeah, reverse <laughs> toxic hospitality. I, I really like to call attention to the gallery space as a uh, venue of spectacle and a space of observation. Um, as someone who is like super interested in just, I guess politics of sight, but also the history of like visualization technologies, uh, predator prey relationships, that evolutionary history of the eye, which is often linked to the advent of predation. Fascinating. So I really like when viewers enter a space for them to become kind of consumed by the spectacle and for their sort of safe space as a, um, a non-specific wandering viewer or I, I, I really like for that to become destabilized. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons I, I liked the Théâtre de l'Inconnu is because there's a lot of layers there happening with thinking about um, anatomical theaters and being on like the site of a dissection um, and the silkworms gland, like being enormous in the space and creating this kind of scale shift of being enormous, but also like a microscopic object. And it was very like enticing and fun to come sit on this like disco object, which then as you're listening to the narrative becomes rather sinister. So that was, um, I would, that was something that I kind of aim for and it's, it's more or less successful depending on how lucky I got like with receiving ideas um so I think this one will this project will um this installation will to some degree achieve that um and so far as the artist talk um hi friends <laughs> um and so far as the artist talk it's weird when you're imagining an anonymous public because it's really false because no one in the audience embodies what the anonymous public is. So it actually makes, I felt like a shift at some point when I was preparing my talk and my friends were like, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna be there. And my family members were also telling me. And I think that that sort of moved me in a way that was like, oh, I'm, I just wanna kind of speak to those people with the sort of extended invitation of engaging with people I don't know in the same way. Does that also translate to the audience of your, your artwork and installations? Mm. No. Um, I never think about my audience in specific. I think of my audience, I think for me a work is successful when it can be engaged with at the level of sort of like high-end curated curators, philosophers, like very educated people, but also if it doesn't speak to children, then it doesn't work for me as in my own personal practice of like what I'm doing. So I think that I usually uh, make work, I guess I do think of my audience, but I think of them in terms of those two poles as um, children and like philosophers. <laughs> and, you know, children are sometimes the most fascinating philosophers. And if you're a good philosopher, it means you're probably pretty childish also. Yeah, there's a spectrum there. 
Uh, are there questions in the audience? Great. Okay. On your left, on your moment. There we go. Anonymous crowd member. Um, <laughs> when you were talking about um, Tet and you, you mentioned how the narrator is rehearsing her own life cycle and ultimately death scene, something to that effect. Um, it seems to me that this recent project is maybe similar, um, that it's also kind of a rehearsal of maybe a collective life cycle of sorts. And I'm wondering if you could give us a hint about maybe where that cycle goes. What's the story ending? Or do we have to wait? <laughs> wait, could you say it again? <laughs> Sorry, just like. It just seems what? to me that there's maybe a rehearsal, a, an, an idea there of the rehearsal of the life cycle in the earlier project, which is relevant to this this story as well. Um, 17, 15 characters or something you said. So it's a little bit different, but but I get the feeling that, that we're rehearsing mm. some kind of collective life cycle. Yeah. Perhaps. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I think like the... Um, so firstly, the video is a perfect, is a seamless loop. I love the loop. And I chose the loop, especially because of the way that the parrots tend to repeat themselves in a loop. Um, and this kind of like, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of nice imagery there with the sort of eternal return of the same, the Ouroboros who's like eating his own tail. Um, I think there's something about superficiality, which, um, I'm not com committed to saying that birds' language is, uh, birds' use of language is superficial because I think that they um, extract like other forms of meaning that are inaccessible um, to humans, uh, even though they're like using our so-called language. So I think I'm, I'm very... So I don't want to say that they're just mimicking or that it's just sort of form without content, but I do, I do think that the superficiality of the repetitions and sometimes um, like um, that that superficiality is like a part of the theater of reenactment um, and whether it's like a theater of domesticity or like a theater of captivity. Um, I mean, often like captivity is a form of spectacle and the birds are kind of uh, like modern day jesters. Um, the same way the canaries is like their market value is increased by learning certain tunes like the birds and the way that they circulate on YouTube as performers and entertainers is monetized. So, um, mm -hmm no idea how to come back to your <laughs> your question but uh yeah definitely this kind of rehearsal um and i think it's hilarious like when the bird is calling the dog and i watch that's larry the parrot's name is larry and he he and the larry the parrot they because i you know it's ambiguous they play both the actor of Abdul, and they also play the bird, uh, the dog, excuse me, the dog Max, because they just go back and forth in their home setting between calling the dog and then answering for the dog. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so yeah, I don't remember what I was saying, but yeah, it's very like rehearsed and improvised at the same time. Question. Uh, I'm going to take a question question from the back of the room and then I'll okay. make my way my way forward. Thank you for the fascinating uh, talk and such awesome like documentation to follow your train of thought and your research. Um, so they, I kind of wanted to go off of that. Um, obviously your, your, your practice seems to be super heavily researched and at the same time there's such a strong sense of humor within all of it and I'm curious how you find that the balance to do that and like what can humor bring to work because I'm very fascinated in in interjecting more humor into my own practice and I find it's very difficult to bring it and balance it so I'm curious how you do that yeah sure so I don't really research my work I just am kind of like nerdy on the side and I like to like read those books like that I 
actually I mostly hang out with smart people I don't really read that much it's weird because I act like I read a lot but really I just hang out with smart people and then and then I copy what they say no not fully not fully but really like I think that a lot of my learning is um from you know the company that I keep and I do read books but I I normally um if I do, I, I allow myself the liberty of starting off with really like pedantic, horrible ideas, knowing that I will always come across a way of undermining like my own intellectual sort of like predilections because they're not, I find them not helpful as an artist. But at the same time, I like to feed my mind and also just like get excited about learning about history and things. So um, I think for me, like art making is is essentially really fun. I don't get super stressed out about it. I get stressed out with um, the professional aspects of things, for sure. That's super stressful, like funding and ugh, all that stuff is is very stressful. But in general, like when I come home and it's Friday, I just want to like have a glass of wine and like play. So for me, like my approach to art making is very much based in play. Uh, it's very connected for me to my childhood, um, which my mom was an artist. And then on my dad's side, they're all scientists, which probably <laughs> explains, you know, the, the me as their progeny. So, yeah, I think that I think that taking the pressure off of like, oh, have I conceived a worthy idea and really just being like, enjoying it is really is really important to me and trusting that along the way like by accident and by accident only at least for me like will I ever find artwork that's worthy of like being disruptive in a public sphere okay I'm gonna um, walk my way down whilst I pose a follow-up <laughs> question perhaps I mean you say you don't don't read much uh, but it did seem like you you read or think with objects quite a bit. And like, could you say a little bit more about your collection and what you keep close and how you maybe start to build a story from an object? Sure, definitely digital objects as in PNG files. Uh, I don't have many physical objects because I'm lazy <laughs> and you have to carry them around and stuff. So. I've kind of gravitated away from that because it feels like a lot of responsibility. Uh, mostly I have, I have pictures. I mean, I just browse, you know, like everyone just like, you know, you're on the toilet scrolling. It's like one of the most <laughs> productive uh, forms of artistic research, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, it's fun being an artist, you know, like just feel no, there's just, I, I don't really feel responsibility. But I do in some ways, for sure. Mara, hello. Hi. That was so <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is a technical question about, you said the parrot that did the voice of the guy who's calling his dog is the same parrot that did the voice of the dog. But <laughs> what is that sound? Because that was not the sound of a dog. Oh, so uh, we're missing the opening sequence. We're missing like the uh, a lot. There's a whole whole thing that happens in this movie. There's all it all make it all kind of like holds together. Uh, and in the opening sequence, we see like Abdul calling his dog Max. Uh, we didn't see Max. Here we just kind of heard what uh, is it called a cassowary? that really deep rumble that does not sound like a bird. Uh, and what's really cool is they're kind of considered like the modern day ancestors in terms of vocal cords of dinosaurs. They're very dinosaur-esque looking, but insofar as we imagine dinosaurs roaring like lions, false. Like they actually were more likely to be making these very guttural kind of pulsing sounds. So there are a few wild birds that figure in to the soundscape of the video. Um, so we will hear the dog barking, um, which is Larry imitating his dog, Max. So he's calling Max and we'll actually hear, yeah, I did use the same birds sound effect for the dog barking too. 
Yeah. So cool. Mm-hmm. And then I'm thinking that dinosaurs are also a lot more like birds than we previously thought too, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is following up on what Jamie said, this kind of rehearsal of death. I was thinking about the Attenborough video and how the bird in that video is rehearsing the sounds of its death because the forest, the, the deforestation sounds and how there's something like, of course, humor is all over your work, but there's also something deeply sad in your work and um, how those two affects kind of play together and our bedfellows. I, it's not really a question. It's just like a comment that I love you and your work and <laughs> you're brilliant. Well, I def- thank you. I definitely, the first thing I would like to speak to is the fact that that uh, lyre bird clip is like highly theatricalized. So those birds are not wild birds at all. David Attenborough is like, in the rest of the video, he's like hiding behind a tree and like, you know, the classic, like the camera's there and then David Attenborough like peeks out <laughs> behind the tree. It's hilarious. <laughs> And it's actually filmed in a zoo. Yeah. So what I love, what inspires me deeply is how like fictive nature documentaries are. And you know, like the way everything is spliced together and then they kind of create this incredible narrative, which is so like realistic. And the, like, no, there was not a female like over there and a male over there, like wooing each other. Like this was all spliced together after the fact. Uh, so that's very much the case. Um, and also, uh, yeah, I think it, the other sound effects in that video are like children laughing and car alarms. And so anyways, he, he, I think they get a little bit carried away with like this narrative of deforestation, which is a massively real problem. So like, why not? Um, so yeah, so there's that. Um, and then Insofar so far as, uh, I guess, you know, for sure, yeah, I really, I mean, melancholy <laughs> and grief and the, the sort of theatricality of it. I, I'm just always interested in representation. I just can't enter into anything without thinking about the means uh, through which it's represented. And I think that's something for me which connects art and science together in an interesting way is that, uh, and especially, you, this really comes to the fore when you're looking at the history of science because science is looking for a visual language for itself. And I love these kind of this, uh, all these moments of sort of trying and then it kind of like being a little bit awkward or like having to like be indebted to the arts in some way. And at the same time, like, you know, um, the arts too, looking to science sometimes but it, it's not so much that I want to say that art and technology are like buddies, but more so that there's a lot of overlaps in terms of representation, um, the way nature is represented. That's very interesting. The way like bodies, particularly feminized bodies are represented, that, that's really fascinating. Um, I also find the history of science just so whimsical. And that's really ironic because science is not supposed to be fun. <laughs> and yeah, it's just like, I find it hilarious and like exciting, uh, especially when you get these ancient accounts of what is. And then for me, it's like, oh, wow, like what is is actually very unstable and changes with time, which is just like really kind of liberating to me. Um, yeah. So I think it's easy to get carried away uh, with like the discursive <laughs> kind of elements of like oh because unicorns are because because unicorns are written about to exist they exist but I'm I feel entitled to get carried away with that um so I do um I don't have a very well formulated question but I just want to ask you I'm I'm also very much fascinated about the like the art history way that medicine or anatomy was represented in the time of those images that you showed us. Um, so I would like to ask you a little bit more about that. Uh, but also, I'm I was just thinking with the questions and everything that like the influence of theater in the pieces that you showed and how like in Greek theater, for for instance. 
um, the tragedy was actually something where you could find some hope because it was um, like um, reconfiguration of the other. But then comedy was where really the tragedy was because comedy was commenting about something that was just like not changeable, not possible to change. And then I also thought about like the, the difference between a body and a person. And, and I, I see your work and I just find hard to find the humanity there. I just find it kind of like you're showing us a dehumanized mm. way, like mm. picture of bodies. And you know, like there's like, there's kind of like hard to see people, you know, mm. like, yeah. Just that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm never interested. I never really put my own self into my, I mean, I do insofar as sentiment, but I'm not super interested in um, people, I guess, <laughs> that are not in my personal life. But I'm not, yeah, I, I think I think I'm just someone like I like to laugh and I have like kind of a dark, ironic sense of humor. And so I just have to have that energy in my work. Sometimes I question it because I'm like, oh, like, can I make something more serious or quiet? I mean, I think Teatro Blanconu, like it has elements of humor where you kind of like laugh on the inside. Um, and I am working on, on new projects, uh, which are kind of softer on the humor. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting what you said just about how comedy is actually often like where the like grief of like is is the vehicle through which like a society's like grief often expresses itself and that there is something kind of appropriate about that somehow um but yeah I think I'm always I definitely operate at kind of a distance in terms of like my own personal things sometimes I think about like it would be really interesting to make a work with my grandfather He's kind of like a really fascinating character. So I've kind of thought about that sometimes, especially like a really old 3D animated character, which you don't see very often, and especially just like representing older people you don't see very often. So sometimes I'm curious about honing in and, and perhaps on future works, I will, because I am interested in like, yeah, seeing how seeing my own blind spots in a way and sort of like new things to explore. So I could see, I could see doing that. And also I am not committed to like 3D animation or 2D animation. I'm definitely uh, work and change mediums according to just like something new and fun. Uh, and according to like the ideas that I'm working with. So I can definitely see going back to using like real actual people, which I think will make um or could in some cases add a bit more of like a human element to the work yeah hi mara <laughs> hi um it's really exciting to see pretty thought of the seven excellent images and um speaking of representation um i was wondering if you could speak a little further um, about the physical appearance of the characters and how um, how that came about. And also um, just like looking at this still image, sort of like the lighting, um, the contrast. Um, yeah, I'm really curious to hear about what was the inspiration behind uh, the beard baby. <laughs> Thanks. So one of the programs we're working with uh, is called Daz, and it's a free uh, like pay in-store purchases uh, kind of app. And uh, the way that it works is you buy, like imagine you buy a character and that character comes with like 10,000 toggles <laughs> where you can adjust like their nostrils and you can adjust like like every single tiny detail and you can actually layer multiple character like you could take multiple profiles and bring them all onto a character and then you're just playing with these toggles so a lot of it was kind of just random uh jason harvey at the time was who i was working with in designing the characters and we would kind of just pass the files back and forth until somebody felt alive uh, we didn't think too much about it to be honest it was kind of just listening to the voices and being like, who should these people be? Insofar as the set, 
Um, I fully control all of the colors, wardrobe, um, even I do all of the cameras and all of the like finalized lighting. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> not like the glorious uh, film production where you have like all these assistants, <laughs> like it's, it's super intense and exhausting. And each shot is like, like each two second shot is just so much, so much work. Um, but that said, we worked really hard on the lighting and I think we're, we're getting much better now. I'm really happy with these results of learning just like key lighting and fill lighting and rim lighting, kind of learning how to do that. Um, the 3D space is very much like real life, but since I don't have camera experience, it's really hard to kind of imagine how all of it like works. It's just, it's really weird. That's all I can say. <laughs> It's like, um, but it's really fun because you just can, you know, change everything, all of these things like, oh, I don't want a shadow from this light, like all of this, which makes it even more complex visually. And, but um, yeah, very much so. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I'm I'm grateful you asked that question because I was also very curious about the representation and character development coming from a bird's voice, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, that was just purely imagined. Yeah. Uh, this might be our last question. Um, are you okay to take one more question? Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk, Mara. Um, I have a fairly simple question. Um, I also work with collage, um, and I was quite intrigued when um, you were talking about kind of like the source material, which is like some of them YouTube videos. So I was wondering if you are planning on contacting the mm -hmm. sources that you do know of um, and telling them that you've made this work or not and why or why not? Sure, it's a great question. <laughs> People that I know <laughs> know that I will randomly bring this up in the middle of dinner being like, should I contact them? Should I not? Because I'm scared <laughs> to contact them. So basically, um, from a copyright perspective, I feel 100% like fine because there is like thousands of sound bites. And so when you actually read Canadian copyright law, um, it's always a subjective process. And so far as does the collage transcend the original content? So um, I think collaging is really important because we've been it's like a part of contemporary art for like over a hundred years. So we need to like figure out how that works in the internet age. Definitely, like a, for me, there's a very strong ethics around uh, appropriating. Very, uh, you know, and um, yeah, I feel like like I I never appropriate in a way that I feel uncomfortable with or that I feel like like takes kind of uh, creativity from another artist and um, like puts it towards my own work or something. So I've never gotten, I've never had issues with that. Um, in this case, there's a couple bird of the bird owners. So Pebble, the cockatoo, who we who I showed a clip of, her owner is a um, so Pebble is a rescue, and that owner, his name is Kelly. He's Canadian, uh, and whenever he posts about his bird, he always puts like um, adopt, don't shop, and he has a really strong conscience. He's not working it's like he's not working as a bird breeder. So he's not monetizing Pebble. And any money that he does make, he gives it to rescues. He's run a rescue in the past. Um, part of our, part of the exhibition I'm working on, I didn't go into all the other components, but it has a bunch of other components besides the video, though the video is the main part. But one of the things I wanna be doing is uh, we're planning to like, instead of making a catalog as uh, be printing merchandise to do like a fundraiser, for a local sanctuary, because a lot of these birds live to be 80 years old. So even if you love your bird and you adopt it and you take good care of it your whole life, it can very well outlive you. And it's very complicated how to deal with these birds that have enormous personalities, a lot of anxiety. Uh, they're meant to be in like the wild. They're not domesticated like dogs and cats. Like so, it's a it's it's a it's a pretty complex area. Uh, I definitely want to like. I, I don't know. I don't really sell like work that much. So I don't know if people are going to buy stuff, but I hope that we can sell some things. 
so we can uh, not artwork, but sell some of the merchandise so we can do a fundraiser. That's been a part of the exhibition from the beginning. But I think what I'm getting to here is that some owners really monetize their animals. And so I'm concerned that if I tell them I'm making a video, they're gonna be like, oh, artists are so rich. Like I need to like get money. Uh, whereas an owner like Kelly, like I'm totally gonna reach out to because Pebble has this like wonderful monologue um, in one of the next scenes that we're gonna be working on. And so I'll definitely reach out to some of the bird owners that I feel kind of confident with, like this man, Kelly. Um, but I haven't really decided about reaching out to some of the ones that are more like trying to make money off the animals and stuff, which like, I don't judge. Those animals often get really good treatment because they're like, you know, show animals. But uh, yeah, I'm still kind of unsure yet in the credits if I'm going to put the specific birds and things. Even just linguistically, that brings in the consideration of so-called fair use and the fair use of animals that are monetized by owners to begin with. I mean, mm -hmm. just linguistically, that is a, a, a bit of a rabbit hole um, to continue on with now. Capitalism. Of animals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much, everybody, for, for your questions. And thank you, Mara, for your answers and reflections. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom people. <laughs> so yeah, there's a few thanks to follow on. Absolutely, thank you, Zoom folks. Uh, thank you also, Adele, for the co-hosting support. Uh, thank you, Joshua, who is in the tech uh, booth uh, for the troubleshooting and testing before we started. Uh, thank you also to Karen Zippiger, who is always in the room, if not physically in the room, for all of the publicity support and the great posters that she makes often on very short notice. Uh, but also thank you for coming um, and being, being here with us. Um, those who are hungry and thirsty are very welcome to migrate towards Grumpy's, uh, which is on Bishop. I always forget. I mix up Bishop and Nikkei all the time, but that way. Um, we'll be sort of like make, we can make a little robe ducklings going towards Grumpy's uh, and I'll order pizza so if you have dietary requirements or preferences do let me know what your favorite toppings are um, and we can continue the, the discussion there thanks so much and good night <laughs>